Hello, you're listening to Tangents and Tomes, a podcast where two old friends get together to read, review, and rant about books. If you're driving while listening, keep your eyes on the road. Otherwise, sit back, relax, and enjoy. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. How are, how are you doing? I'm I'm okay. I uh, feel a little... I mean, it's, I mean, I've been <laughs> this <is great. laughs> preparing for this, so, I mean, it's not like I just, you know, got back from a spa or something. I'm not like, <laughs> anyways, how are you? Um, boyfriend's two sisters are visiting. We drove down, um, met his parents, uh, halfway to pick him up and then, uh, have been hanging out at the house took him up to see the scenic, uh, like the scene, the scenic viewpoint. And I found out, I don't know how I didn't realize this. Um, the younger of the two sisters is a really great skier and has been skiing with her friends and doing, you know, black diamond runs. So I'm like, okay, cool. And she has, you know, her own skis and brought her own skis. So we're going to go skiing on like Wednesday. We bought tickets ahead of time so they would be cheaper we bought two days for wednesday and there's and so i'm gonna have to go and get skis but yeah so i'm gonna be skiing here pretty soon that's gonna be real exciting um but otherwise yeah just family visiting which is really fun what else did you um uh i i (laughs) yes i i read another book um i read steeplejack by AJ somebody. I'm mm-hmm. so bad at remembering authors' names. I'm really You're terrible. on top of it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I read that, which I was expecting. I don't know what I was expecting. I think I just was expecting it to be a little more fantasy, but it was much more uh, detective mystery, mm-hmm. which was really cool and fun. Um, yeah, but those have been my days. A lot of travel and then re- reading a book. I just read, I just two days. I started Thursday, finished a Friday, and I was it was like bam, bam. That's usually how I do it. Yeah, you gotta binge Just those not books, man. This time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So for those of you who listened last time, we got a bit of a history lesson to catch up on. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> Before so, we dive into the spoilers, we got. Well, we I got mean, some, we should. We got some of our own corrections. Also, tell them that this week. We read the last half of Shadow and Bone by Lee Bardugo, yes. which is the first right. book in the Grisha trilogy. Yes. And so for the first section, we're going to talk about kind of our review and some non-spoiler stuff. And then we're going to get into a spoiler section where you can, Beautiful. you know, kindly leave and if you so not wish. hear the spoilers if you care to. Which is 90% of the best banter, but uh, your choice. Yeah, seriously. Like, I'm... Just I'm, read like, the ex- book. Just read it real read quick. It's a fast read. Right now. <laughs> and come and back. <laughs> come back and hear all my brilliant ideas because I am like okay, exploding. But, but not yet. But not yet. First, we got to get through this history lesson. Okay? Yeah. Okay. So. And then, and then, and then we'll tell you when you can leave. Not yet. Don't go. Yeah. Stay right here. So I just kind of wanted to um, touch back on some of the things that we talked about last episode. Because we were talking a lot about stuff in generalizations, and I was like, you know, I haven't actually researched this in a while, so I looked up everything. Of course you did. What do you mean, course? I'm not that big of a nerd, but I am a big (laughs) enough nerd that I realized I had reread all of this stuff before once, just for fun. Anyways, (laughs) um, first of all, I'm going to explain that when we were talking about um, the cover and how it features those very Russian domes. The pointy, the pointy things. The pointy domes is on the cover to kind of tell you like, hey, this is sort of Russian based, potentially in a Heads up. theoretical world. The name of the distinctive dome towers on the covers is called an onion dome. A typical dome or cupola is like a sphere cut in half and placed on top of a tower like a lid covering. But the onion dome is wider than the drum it sits on, and the pointed tip is usually longer than the diameter. They can be really colorful. Like, I was looking at St. Basil's Cathedral, and it literally looks like decorated cake. Like, that that's just fondant layering, because it's so brightly colored and stuff. Like, oh my god, can I eat it? And the colors can represent different aspects of Christian icons, because 
these onion domes usually figure on religious buildings, like cathedrals. Mm. So, as for Russian history, so I wish you guys I've prepared could prepared a little see, speech. Wish you could see our, our Google <laughs> Doc right now. You are yeah, missing out, so you guys. I'm gonna sort of go in reverse chronological order here because I want to. That's kind of usually how I best make a picture of timelines if I can kind of see where I'm going with it. Sure. The Russian Revolution occurred in 1917, and it was actually two revolutions. The Russian provisional government was formed as a temporary system until the Soviet Union could be established later in 1917. So that all happened in one year. So if the Russian the Russian Revolution happened in the early 1900s, before the Russian Revolution occurred, the Russian Empire existed for 200 years, starting in 1721, and then all the way to the revolution in 1917. For most of that time, it was an absolute monarchy, so the Tsar was like the king, until 1906, just a few years before the Russian Revolution that would take place in the early 1900s, it became a constitutional monarchy, basically an autocracy. Also, the Russian Empire was ginormous. Like, Russia's big now, but they used to have more land further south of present-day Russia. And also, Damn. they just, they had Alaska. Oh, yeah. They just had it. And, like, <laughs> their <laughs> land spanned, like, across that entire hemisphere, pretty much. Damn. <laughs> Period films and novels help me contextualize history, so I'm going to point out that Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy uh, was published in 1873 to 76, serially, as like in magazines and stuff. Mm. That novel takes place before the revolution, while Russia was still a true monarchy. I remember that the train was used as a symbol for industrial advancement and growing change in Anna Karenina, and I realized that Ravka doesn't seem to have trains. So I'm not yeah. sure if this means that Shadow and Bone is taking place before the Industrial Revolution, or if it just means Ravka hasn't invested in an industrial infrastructure due to their reliance on the Grisha. For example, we see the Squallers, the Grisha who manipulate air, propelling the sand skiffs across the fold instead of using like a steam engine or something. Mm. FYI, the first steam locomotive, i.e. a train, was made in 1804, and the first practical one for people to actually use was developed by 1813. So it seems the farthest advanced technology Ravka has that is independent of the Grisha is a rifle, as you pointed out last episode. Mm -hmm. So I tried to research the rifle, but guns are kind of like a morphing technology that's constantly changing, obviously, so it's hard to mm -hmm. say exactly when the rifle was invented, but the true rifles were seen as early as the mid-15th century. So, like, Tudor England, King Henry VIII, and Anne Boleyn, and then Shakespeare would be later on, but technically, like, they still wore the same clothes. So if you think Shakespeare, roughly that, but then a hundred years prior. So that's around when rifles became a thing. They were a replacement for the musket, which was... Um, less accurate due to the bullet's round ball-like shape. Rifles basically oh, right. just had an elongated bullet and a longer barrel to increase precision. Long mm. rifles were common by the 1700s and were used in the American Revolution. So if I'm trying mm. to think of like what time period this could be taking place, rifles exist, but trains don't exist. So it's like, that's a big span of time. <laughs> I'm not yeah. really sure. So... All this just basically made me even more unsure. Like, I had been thinking that it took place leading up to the Russian Revolution, but the lack of technology makes that seem, like, really stupid of me. But also, the lack of technology doesn't mean anything, because Russia was so big and had so many dissonant economic backgrounds, I could easily see why Alina never saw a train. Even in Anna Karenina, mm. you couldn't get everywhere by train. It was usually a combination of train and horse-drawn carriage, yeah. especially if you weren't going to one of the major cities. So mm. after all this, I finally just looked it up. Lee Bardugo said in an interview that if it were set in the real world, it would probably take place in the early 1800s. So there. <laughs> That's the answer. <laughs> All that 
for all an that. answer from the author herself. I mean, <laughs> I do think that it's Great. helpful to know some of that information about the Russian Revolution because I can seriously no, yeah. see it kind of being talked about in the novel, plus the yeah. oncoming technology, because that's one of the fears the Darkling has of of the outer world and the place of Grisha in that country, like the position of Grisha once technology comes into Ravka and what that could mean yeah. for them. Oh, that's funny, though. You did so much work. I mean, how long did that take, though? <laughs> I don't know. But I also, because I mentioned um, Rasputin in the last episode and how much sure. the apparat was kind of reminding me of Rasputin, mm -hmm. I also looked up some information about him. He was a self-proclaimed monk or holy man, but he was never actually, like, ordained or anything. But he did become, like, favored by a certain number of priests when he moved to some city or something. Mm. This is much less prepared. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so then when he was there, he kind of fell into these circles and he met the royal family and he became a favorite counselor to Tsar Nicholas... Nikolai? Nicholas? Uh, <laughs> I'm on top of this. Yeah, so he became a favorite counselor of, or a friend to the royal family. He was mm -hmm. able to um, help Alexei, their son, and heir apparent to Russia. Ah. Um, he was the only son, and he was the youngest, and he had hemophilia, uh, which was, you know, seriously dangerous because they didn't know how to treat it. And mm -hmm. he seemed to know how to help. A lot of people, like, Rumors abounded in Russia. There's a lot of dispute about what kind of man Rasputin was, um, yeah. because so many accounts of him just would change. Like, the people who talked about him, their accounts, everything they said would just change all the time. And <laughs> so it kind of made him seem even more like a legend. And so uh, also, so, like, leading up to the revolution, Tsar Nicholas was... Um, kind of busy with World War One, And yeah. apparently it wasn't going so well. Their involvement was kind of not great. And so mm -hmm. with him away, the Tsarina, the Queen, and mm -hmm. Rasputin were kind of like, had stronger powers because the king was away. And so they kind of took over some of those responsibilities. But people hated that. They were like, this man is you know, influencing our queen and our king and, like, yeah. what what is going on between Rasputin and the queen. This is all uh -huh. super shady. We don't like it. So people generally had a lot of, like, questions about what kind of position Rasputin and how much power he had amongst the royals and amongst actual, like, you know, politics. So, okay, so he died just before the Russian Revolution. And he was assassinated by a group of people who had lured him away to this other prestigious family estate. And this is basically, like, just direct from Wikipedia, but he's become... Rasputin has become something of a legend, some of it probably invented or embellished, because of the people who killed him could never really remember how they killed him. Um... <laughs> The date what? varies because of the Gregorian calendar issues and so on, but it was pro it was December of 1916, and they lured him to this other like house owned by Yusupov or Yugosova, at some family. I don't. I I, just, I forget. I read this like you know a couple of days ago, <laughs> so <laughs> it's been a while. Anyways, they invite him over and they they offer him, like, a feast. So they're all sitting there and eating with him, and they've put cyanide in all the food. And so they're, they were poisoning him. The group led him down to the cellar, where they served him cakes and red wine laced with a large amount of cyanide. According to legend, Rasputin was unaffected, um, <laughs> although they had supplied enough poison to kill five men. Wow. It has been suggested that Rasputin may have developed an immunity to poison, but, I mean, it 
really doesn't make sense. There was something else about like how possibly the cyanide it had like evaporated or been destroyed because they cooked it. Yeah. I don't know. So they poisoned him and it was getting late and they were like, why isn't this guy keeling over? So they were worried that he wasn't going to die quickly enough so that they still had time to hide the body. Yeah. So then they shot him in the back and then he like keeled over and fell on the floor and they were like, cool, all right, we need to go get supplies so we can deal with the body. So they leave and then one of them returns to get his coat and when he does, he goes to the room where the body is and he's watching Rasputin and Rasputin's eyes open and he jumps up and he's still alive then like the other guys freaking out all the other people come in and then they shoot him like three more times and then he keels over (laughs) um but apparently he's still breathing and he's not dead yet so they all beat him and oh my god they bind him and wrap him and him in a carpet he's still alive this is so violent i know i don't mean it to be that violent the thing is that i've always heard about The many methods that were used to kill him, because it's so, like, legendary, people are like, oh my god, can he die? People were (laughs) freaking out. (laughs) So they wrap him up in um, a carpet, and then they throw him into a river, and he manages to get out of his binding and out of the carpet, but he does finally die of drowning. Wow. So there were, like... I don't know, like, six different ways that, you know, six different times that they were like, that'll be the last of him. And then he just kept coming. I mean, think how freaky that is. So. What a legend. The other thing, though, is that he was buried. And then, um, like, the the royal family buried him in, like, a plot or whatever. And then after the Russian Revolution, people were like, fuck that. They dug up his remains and then burned them. But the thing is that, of course, these were just, like, you know, casual people. I mean, if you can say that desecrating a grave and performing a (laughs) cremation is casual. Casual. (laughs) Um, (laughs) (laughs) But they basically, they were unprofessional. So they just burned the body. And if you burn a a corpse um, without snapping the tendons, the tendons will shrink and cause the body to convulse. So they were there watching his body burn and then it started to move and it sat up and it started waving its arms and everyone was like, oh my God, will this guy die? (laughs) (laughs) So that's definitely led to kind of like this legendary mythos around him. Wow. And around the kind of guy he was. Oh my God. Thank you. Yep. That's, that's the history lesson. Awesome. Ding, bling, bling. Okay. That's the history lesson. <laughs> so, what's your review of the book oh, now that it's ride. done? Oh, confused. Yeah, I'm I, kind of like, was, where are we going with this? The the end. Um, it was it was funny. Where we stopped was literally like right before. Well, wait. This is the non spoiler section. No, 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 no. I know, okay. but it was like it was right before like so much of the the like what felt like the climax. Yeah, it didn't really you know? feel like a full-on climax. Yeah. It didn't no, feel like it, a final it, showdown. It to me, to me it almost felt like there were there was enough information in that one book to be two books. Mm-hmm. Like I um I felt that the end, the the last part of it felt very rushed to me. I, and I think it was just because a longer period of time or what, what felt like a long period of time was taking place over a very short number of pages. So it felt, it felt kind of rushed and it felt a little weird. Um, and then, and then just, you know, I had, I had my theories and, you know, I felt like I could sort of see where it was going, but even still, I wasn't quite satisfied. Now I'm just really curious to see where these books are going to go. Yeah. I'm kind of like, it left and us... I'm, in a place I'm where worried. that's definitely yeah because yeah it didn't leave me like excited i'm more i'm more now worried <laughs> about 
about where about where we're going and I I feel like I see a lot of bad things to come which which isn't always the greatest feeling yeah to be left kind of at just the end like of a book you know on so how I know story trajectories usually go I'm kind of like if she had been able to just wrap it up that would have been yeah. a happy ending anyways yeah I don't want to say too much but I actually enjoyed the second half way more like the second half it was really starting yeah. to come together for me and I definitely yeah. saw like all the intricate lines finally falling into place like the first yeah. half I was I was like really unimpressed except for with the kind of cool concept she was going for oh, but yeah. now I can actually see like how the plot has been coming together yeah and so it is it is actually pretty um smart and if you hear the spoilery section You'll hear all my theories, and my theories are definitely stuff that I'm theorizing based on stuff I learned in school. So there's, yeah. so I kind of get the feeling that Bardugo is is doing a lot of this on purpose. And actually, my friend literally said like it that makes sense because it's Lee Bardugo, and I was like, "What do you mean?" And she was like, "Oh, you know, she was born in Jerusalem. She grew up in LA. She went to Yale. Of course, she's gonna know all that stuff." So, <laughs> she's very intellectual. Ah, okay. But it is, like, it is good where she's bringing in these interesting dynamics of, like, do we like a character once they've done something we don't like them doing, you know? Mm. Where, like, she's bringing in some moral questions. Mm. And the dialogue definitely improved in the second half, I felt. Ah, okay. Even though, like... Even though she had so few conversations with the Darkling, and I mean, she had probably less with Mal as well, but I still feel like conversations were just better with both of those characters in the second yeah. half. Yeah, I agree. All right, you ready? Yeah, let's go for it. We are diving into spoilers. You have been warned. Go read the book right now and then come back. Listen to the first podcast. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then, and then skip come ahead to this point in this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> we good? We good. All right. Spoilers. You've been warned. I think we need a little ditty. It's your for fault. This. It's your own fault now. Yeah, I know. I, I, I was, yeah, I was trying to be like, you you've know, been warned. You, you, you got it coming. All right. So, spoilers. You go. So, Okay, um, so, God, I have so many weird feels. Well, we can explain some of kind of what we were getting yeah. at in that review section. What so, was, like, can you, oh, God, I, I, I had some theories that were wrong. Uh, I, I agreed with you. Um, I thought that they had, like, a blood bond, and it turns out that's not yeah. how she got that That star. was not, no, it was not. That was, that was the very end, right. Mm -hmm. I was, I, yeah, I was pretty convinced that that was what it was. So that had nothing to do with it, clearly. It was, it was a emotional attachment that was forcing her to constantly uh, not accept herself. Or repress which was really, herself. Yeah. Something that I thought was funny was that, so when we recorded the first half, and, you know, chapters, like, up till 11, I was really weirded out. I was still like, he's 120. I don't, I don't like your flirting and all of that. And then literally it was like two pages into chapter 12. And I'm like, he has disheveled hair. And now, now I like it somehow. <laughs> I'm like, this is like that, that scene where, you know, he's like, it's literally like the beginning of chapter 12. Yeah. But then it's, we it's, find out he's so way cute. older than even Dumbledore. I know. And so, and so I was like, it's so cute. And I was hooked. And then literally like, you know, yeah. So 12, I was like, this is real cute. And then 13, chapter 13. <laughs> okay, wait, sorry. <laughs> Side note. Um, in chapter 12, he's like, oh, by the way, don't tell anyone about this. And so I'm like, okay, so now someone has to find out, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Because that's what happens. Someone says, don't tell anyone, and then someone's listening in the shadows. And I was convinced it was going to be Zoya. But nothing happened of that. So, never, so, you also, know. Also, I mean, even that if it did, do you think Zoya would try and, what? <laughs> tell people, lol, 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 the dark one's so know. stupid, he believes a fairy tale. She would get her throat cut. Like, well, it was only because she was mentioned in, like, the first two sentences, mm. you know? 
of the chapter. And then that happened later in the thing. And I was like, oh, I see you. But it didn't happen. So I was wrong. Um, and then so you were you were talking about how, you know, dialogue was better in the second half. But I made this note on chapter 13 that is, leave us. Well, I'll suffer for your pride, boy. I won't ask you again. <laughs> <laughs> I had to write those three lines down because it was so funny. I'm like, it was too good. And then chapter 13, I'm like, oh, he doesn't know what love is. Like, look at him. He kissed her out of the blue. He doesn't know what he's doing. That's so cute. He's got disheveled hair. He's all, he's all like a mess. This is great. And then, <laughs> and then it was like literally a chapter later and I'm like, you are getting into this way too fast. You're like, can I come to your room? And I'm like, no, I know. like boy, you, <laughs> this is, it's like, you are way too experienced now and I don't like it. This is no longer some like disheveled human. This is like, this feels like a trap and I don't like it. And then well, a also, chapter later, I'm like, oh, now we understand he's thousands of years old or some shit. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Oh, the God. thing is like. A lot of this is, I talked about in my theory, a lot of the things you were just talking about, I talk about in my extended theory that I have. Okay. Um, but also, like, like yeah, definitely, like, when that first kiss happened, I was like, whoa, um, there was no preamble. Okay, we're just no. doing this. Um, and then the <laughs> no, second kiss, same thing. I was like, wow, he does not have the I'm moves. not done with <laughs> Why do you think, it's like, I'm not done with you yet. All right, you're... Boy, I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> That's creepy. Yeah. Um, such a pet, such a face. I agree. Although I did actually, like I was saying with those dialogues, there was a specific dialogue that they had right before they kissed for the first time where I was like, see, yeah. this flows so much better than the stupid conversation she had with Mal. And yeah. it was probably just because, you know, it was the beginning of the novel. Um, sure. But, like, I really thought that their conversations were were cute for a hot second there. And I, know. I have to say too. that when Bagra, Bagra started to explain kind of, like, the darker plans of, of the Darkling, I was not 100% convinced. Like, I was like, yeah, oh, yeah, obviously she has to get out of there and do something. She can't, like sit there like a duck and wait for it all yeah. to happen but i was like i feel like there might be another side to this i feel like something else might be going on it's like yeah, yeah. that's true but also maybe there's something else going on i was not 100 yeah. percent sure that the darkling was pure evil shit until he killed the deer oh or no until he said that shit when they were in the middle of the field about like oh. what did he say he said did you tell him what I showed you in the dark? <laughs> that line, I was like... Because <laughs> basically he's he's trying to get her to crack to embarrass her in front of Mal. Yeah. And she, he says, did you tell him, Alina? Does the boy know how willing you were to give yourself to me? Did you tell him what I showed you in the dark? And like, I literally read that line. Like, I was like... Ooh, harsh blow. I see where this is going. Then that last line came and I was like, hot second. Wait, your penis? Like, <laughs> what did you show her? I, I mean, Nothing. it's probably, you know, like, oh, I showed you your desire. Like, I, I, yeah. I was able to make you reveal that you were into me, but it's like, why did Dumb. you have to use those words? Dumb. <laughs> it Dumb. just sounds weird. really bad. I was giggling. Like, this is a very serious scene, and I was giggling. Oh, I know. Oh, my God. Okay, another serious scene where I was like, it was, it was literally, like, right at the end, right? So he says, like, is this your idea of mercy or something weird, right? Mm -hmm. when, she's, when she's leaving him to die, and she smiles. I was like, this is not a smiling moment. I understand what you're trying to convey as a writer being like, it's ironic, but I'm like, you don't, girl, <laughs> why are you smiling? <laughs> Do you have a screw loose? <laughs> I was very, for some reason, upset with that one, with that one line. And I just remember being like, like laughing. And I'm like, I shouldn't be laughing here. Oh, she shouldn't I didn't be smiling. It. That seems so weird. I mean, for me, I know that she but, struggles anyway. with the morality of that choice to leave all the other people on this gift but oh yeah like they i know that 
it's harsh, but, like, when it's, you know, she is basically declaring war in a way. And yeah. and she is surrounded by a bunch of people who literally just saw demonstrated in full transparency what the Darkling was intending or willing to do, right? Yeah. And she, she asks them, like, are you going to do anything? Like, help me. Is this what you yeah. really want, right? And then they don't make a move. And I understand that, like, you know, I mean, if I was on that skiff, I would probably be like, I mean, what do you want me to do? I mean, for the soldiers, it's kind of like, oh, the soldiers just won't go after her. But for any other bystander who's not know, actually, exactly. like, active in this position, they're kind of like, I mean, what? What do you want me to do? I'm in the know, fold right now. I know. I know it's weird. <laughs> I so, like, I mean, it is tricky, but I do get that, like, like they didn't help her. They, I mean... They also, like, didn't really understand, okay. I don't think, either. Like, no one really understood that the power was not her own. No, yeah, I understand. So that whole thing is like, okay, so what do you expect? It's like, what do you expect them to do? You're just suddenly now angry. I thought, yes. But, I mean, the other thing is that, like, they were close to the shore, and she couldn't, I mean, what could she have done, you know? Yeah. And, like, they had the weapons that they usually had. The fact that she had light was a new thing, right? So the skiff should have yeah. been prepared with other weaponry. And, I mean, the skiffs just cross the fold all the time. Ugh. So another thing, though, is that I'm not sure whose team I'm on now. I mean, I'm pretty sure I am on Mal's team because, yeah. I mean... I, I mean, yes. the Darkling just was a real shit, okay? Yes. Real shit. So I, never I don't really think all that, that certain if I was on the Darkling's team. I was on his team for maybe about 0.2 seconds, meaning two chapters. I mean, I wasn't like fully invested. I wasn't like a hardcore shipper, but I did think that you know he had <laughs> he was on the up and up at least, you know. Yeah. And I thought that that was where we were going, but yeah. no. If I find out that eventually that is where we're going, I'm like, okay, he better come no. out of some trance or something. He better have been, a f like, yeah. there had to be some other reason making him do this because yeah. he started to do things that are, like, unforgivable. And it's just not something that I'm okay with the final love interest having done. Just no, no matter how repentant or anything, they yeah. are later. No, um, I don't, I don't like it. So I have no idea what's going to happen. And I now I'm like, Mal and her have to be together because that just sounds so much better. And like, they've been through so I much know. and they're so devoted to each other. They've, they've you know, done the high stakes. Like, I would give my life. They saved each other's lives. They've known each other yeah. since they were children. The other thing, though, is that like, honestly, for the longest time, I was like, not sure that the Darkling was all bad because like, Alina seemed really able to read him she didn't yeah. couldn't just you know instantly know what he was thinking really but like the fact that she was able to tell that you know he was a little bit upset with himself for being interested in her and that like he was kissing her but he was mad at himself for wanting to that's yeah. like i don't know about you but i feel like that's not something you can just know you know or or just fake that is one of the things that made it that made it so difficult but then seeing him, you know, I don't think so he was faking that. I think it's, he's yeah, really like into her, but he doesn't even understand what that's like. Uh, so he's a bit frustrated. I don't know. I don't know about that. I'm see. Okay, so I'm also I yeah. I started even before, just before they went to the ball, um, and <laughs> she's talking with Genya, and she says, you know, to be careful of men in power and different things yeah and then th that that line really was like like i started to be like okay this is the foreshadowing right here like something's gonna start something's gonna go bad like like there's gonna be this isn't going to be all nice which is why when he said can i can i come to your room tonight or whatever i was like okay no, I don't. I don't like this. I think that I think that, you know. There's a lot of stuff here that's like that's going too fast, and I'm starting. I'm starting to see what Gen was talking about, and then Bagra. Okay, little side note about her name. Bagra? I keep thinking of the dark Bagra? crystal. I keep oh, I keep thinking yeah. of the dark crystal, and there is there's a character that's old and wizened and um, named Algra, and so I keep wanting to call her 
Agra. Or, and so that's why I'm calling her Bagra. Because well, it's... I think of her as Bagra. <laughs> but I mean, I have no idea. Um, but I did oh, look I up um, how to pronounce Alina. And it's more and or less is... how we're saying it, but with a Russian accent. So like, Alina. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's what the audio sounded like. <laughs> Great. <laughs> But yeah, Darkling, the Darkling was definitely kind of giving me the, yeah. like, at the end, he was so, giving, he was giving me so, the whole, like, you know, the Hunchback of Notre Dame? Yeah. You know, that priest guy? Yeah. Where he's, like, in love with Esmeralda. Yeah. But he's all hellfire and shit, so. Yeah. Um, that's kind of the vibe I'm getting from the Darkling Interesting. here. Like, okay. He's, okay, sure. <laughs> he's angry attracted to her because he's like, I don't like feeling attracted. <laughs> so uh, yeah. he's like, yeah. Anyways, um, a lot of this goes into a theory I have. Okay, sure. Yeah, Do I don't trust any of it. Get into that. Um, I I had a point. Oh, sorry. Which okay. was which was that the same way that I was feeling um in those in those chapters about what Genya had said is being this foreshadowing so it didn't even though it did surprise me I felt much more willing to accept that as the reality that like that was where the story wanted to go that now now I'm getting that exact same feeling again after the Darkling said you know about Mal that he's not he's he doesn't have this power Mm -hmm. he's he's going to be afraid of you Hmm. so you think that that's going to keep her and Mal apart it was it was only in the moment where she didn't she doesn't want to get rid of the collar. Oh yeah. And I very much believe that Mal is going to see that not as hers, but as a symbol of ownership. Yeah, except you know? that she didn't and Mal, like, Mal will have a hard time him. with it. I know she hasn't, and I, was I don't know that how she well. Didn't. Yeah, I don't know how well she's going to be able to too, or if she really even feels like she can now that it's so much a part of herself. If she's going, if that's just going to be something that she's a little vulnerable about and going to have a hard time talking about, and he's going to think that it's some attachment to the Darkling, oh. and there's going to and and she's, or if she does explain it that it is that it you know then it's a power thing. He doesn't necessarily understand, or maybe he's afraid of you know, I don't know how powerful she is or something. Well, I don't. I do I don't think it's weird know. that she can't take it off. I think that they should yeah. somehow eventually get her to be able to take it on and off. But it yeah. also kind of reminds me of this other book that I read called The Nightmare Affair. And it's mm-hmm. a whole trilogy. And if you haven't read it, it's pretty good. It's <laughs> one of my favorites. Like, it's when I say it's pretty good, it's like really entertaining. It's not, you yeah. know, high quality in it or anything. It's not going to be everybody's favorite. But I just really was like, it was just right for me. Um, nice. But she's basically a nightmare, which I thought was so cool. So it's like a paranormal <laughs> story. Um, yeah. She's a nightmare, which means she, like, sits on people's chest and feeds off their dreams while they sleep, oh. right? And did you did you ever see the movie? Oh, God. There's a movie that's like that, Some this indie film that's about good dreams and bad dreams. And the science of sleep or something like that. Mm-mm. Oh, I think I, I think I know what you're talking about. Oh no, it's called whatever his name is. Oh. Okay. Anyway, I'll find it later. But yeah, no, there's there there's a similar premise to to um an indie movie that I'm thinking of. Okay, well, she goes so to go a paranormal boarding school where a bunch of other people have magical abilities as well. Mm -hmm. Um, that's just her particular ability and nightmares are quite rare and they're kind of ostracized. So eventually she like pairs up with this person. This rarely happens, but where a nightmare and another person are like a pair. And so when she feeds off of that person's dreams, they can basically kind of tell the future. And so it's like a really powerful and cool thing. And so she's found this person this person's a guy yes he's the love interest and he's great (laughs) and um (laughs) and at first they hate each other obviously but it's kind of because like he's just the normal human but now he has to go to this boarding school full of people with magical abilities and he's like dude i'm a sitting duck i have no like powers Um, and he liked his old school and stuff so anyways 
Um, but they're great. So part, some of what happens in their dreams or in her dreams is that she starts to have dreams about this rock and she's trying to like see what's written on the rock and then mm. it shows up in one of the dreams that she's sharing with this guy and this guy is like what's going on and she has to see what the rock says but she she's like trying to get the snow or whatever gunk is on the rock clean it off and she's mm. kind of like manic about it and he sees her doing that in the dream and is like what the hell is going on and then she's not really responding so he's like okay i'll just help then and then she basically shoves him away and she has uh -huh. like this strong impression that whatever's written on the rock only she needs to know it and nobody else can hmm. know it not even him even though they're like super close and hmm. um basically what's written on the rock is like the name of a sword and only the owner can know the true name of the sword. And the sword's name will change all the time. So it's basically like Excalibur. It's uh. supposed to be that sword, but that the name of that sword, you know, is changing because nobody can know the true name. Because as soon as they know the true name, they are the master. Oh, wow. So even though she shares everything with this guy, even their dreams, you know, like a really intimate relationship where they, they yeah. have to work together, she's like he can't know like there's yeah. this really strong possessive need to protect whatever this is um yeah it feels kind of like that with her her amplifier with the the antlers yeah hmm the other yeah that's interesting the other the other thing about the amp the the amplifier is uh all i could think of was like when when, when they were when they were explaining um that you know you only get one amplifier and you know it's a it's a choice that goes both ways or, or that, or that, you know, that, yeah. can, that can go both ways. I know what you're talking I just, about. I, I was thinking of the wand chooses the wizard, Harry. Yeah. But it doesn't really seem and then, quite like no, that. No, it's not. I, of course, a lot of, a lot of the things I think about while I'm reading are very loosely related. <laughs> oh, um, well, <laughs> I mean, so are mine. And like, until you hear the theories, you're going to be like, wait, what? And then I'm just going to have to <laughs> argue as best I can. And you may or may not believe it. But <laughs> Well, and, and the other one, also hashtag Harry Potter, was that, you know, the magic that bonded her. I was trying to explain this to Anthony. He's like, that just sounds like a bunch of bullshit. Um, was that she had created a bond by, by saving the stag's life. Mm -hmm. She had created a bond with a stag that was um, separate from that that was created between the darkling in it when he killed it, and that that it was somehow stronger by by sparing its life by showing it mercy, mm -hmm. um, which of course just made me think of you know, uh, love. Yeah, Harry Potter. The Harry Harry Potter. Yeah. Okay. So this is a little off topic, but I totally get what you're saying, and I agree because um, or like I like, agree with the that, that sounds like bullshit. The concept. <laughs> Well, yeah. he, he, your gremlin just doesn't get it, okay? <laughs> he just doesn't understand love. Um, but it's like, that sounds like horseshit. <laughs> well, the thing is that, like, that's one of the things I love about Harry Potter is that, like, somebody on Tumblr once asserted that Lily's, like, protection spell on Harry wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, her standing in front of him and saying, take my life instead, that that wasn't the magic that she while james was quote unquote buying time unfortunately he he really didn't buy that much time because it all happened too fast but um yeah. that lily was up there casting a spell with words and a wand and that that was necessary to that sort of thing because they were like no magic ever happens without that there has to be a spoken word spell. And I'm like, that's literally what, what we're saying didn't happen. So for me, the whole concept <laughs> of of Lily's, like, it just had to be a certain scenario where it was like, yeah. the, these things fell into line and then that created magic. And that, that yeah. means that we're magic and we can do that. We can build those kinds of dynamics and relationships amongst us and that that is magic. Yeah. Because that was, those were just actions. But yeah. they created something really, really powerful. Yeah. 
actions speak louder than words. Oh, God. <laughs> I actually hate that phrase because I'm really bad at doing things, but I'm really good about talking about them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, same. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it was more... The reason that Anthony was like, that's a bunch of bullshit, is because he was like, okay, she spared, she spared the stag's life for a grand total of two seconds. <laughs> Like, like this connection, he was like, wait, what was the connection? I'm like, this moment that she had where she was like, no, I can't kill him. We'll find another way. And he's like, that was it? I was like, <laughs> that's not that's a connection. That's all she had to do? <laughs> I was like, two seconds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that was why he was like, what? Like, what kind of bond is that? I mean, that's not. <laughs> I was, it definitely, for me, it was important that it actually did matter because when she spared the yeah. stag's life, she was like responding to an internal feeling. And so I was like, that better be worth it because. I know, same. You know, it just went to shit. <laughs> so. I know. I was very much like, because what I was, what I remember reading in the section about when, when she was reading mm -hmm. about amplifiers, they're. They did make it sound that it didn't, it wasn't death, it was a bond. Yeah. It had to, you know, it had to do with, it had to do with a bond that was created between, mm -hmm. between them. So I was like, no, there's gotta be, there's gotta be some way that she can still claim that bond. I mean, the thing for me was that antlers can, do actually just fall off. Mm. And so I was thinking like, oh, so... I'm expecting now the antlers to just pop off. <laughs> and because that is what they do. They will just fall off when they get too big. You don't have to kill antlers to get antlers. I mean, sorry. <laughs> you, don't, <laughs> you don't have to kill... Um, the English major, everyone. Shut up. <laughs> you don't have to kill, like, deer and elk to get their antlers. They just drop them. So I thought that that was going to happen, but I was also kind of like, I mean, since when do, <laughs> like, antlers just pop off of their host right in front of people at the same time? Willy-nilly. Yeah. Because it had to be two at the same time. <laughs> that doesn't always happen. Yeah. Um, yeah, the funny thing was, when they were cutting, I was just imagining, like, a piece of the antler. The and it would be is, like us and it would be a stone i didn't i wasn't picturing what had ended up happening as like mm -hmm. the full collar i wasn't i wasn't picturing that initially mm -hmm. i was as soon as she was talking to bagra and bagra was like look i have a ship you gotta go through the fold and i was like no just go to the north go and find the herd yourself so that then you can have it because even it, because he's still gonna go and kill it and then you're constantly gonna be on the run no claim claim that shit for yourself yeah as which soon is, as which is mal's idea and i was like good man that is that is the plan i believed from the get-go should be right yeah i mean that's what i was thinking too as soon as like we found yes. out how the um ownership of the power and antlers and amplifier whatever the sh shit um yeah. that he who slays it owns that power mm -hmm. um i was thinking oh great well mal was just here an hour ago she just has to find him <laughs> and then they'll go yeah. find the deer or whatever it and is and then good solid yeah i know they just fought but it's fine yeah they'll make up duh they have to i was also convinced he was going to be at the ball which he was i'm like this is the perfect like why else would you create like an elaborate like ballroom scenario if you weren't gonna have mal show up <laughs> i I'm didn't like, expect to see mal i had no idea how she was gonna get reconnected with him i was like he's got to be there i didn't i didn't know how i thought he was because they were saying that it, people from their army that you know were had uh, medals of honor or awards or something mm -hmm. that fancy soldiers were going to also be there from the first army and i was like okay so mal's gonna be there great but it said he was you know in the war room talking or whatever okay so chatting away i'm you ready gonna, to get into your theory yeah i'm Tell gonna me. get into it so so last episode we talked like it, it all came back to harry potter and we did touch on harry potter in this episode but what else do i always kind of have to say is relevant <laughs> I'm not going to cheat and look at your notes. 
Okay, well, I'm going to say Jane Eyre is just all Great. over this. Okay? Of course it is. It is, though. Jane Eyre is in everything. I mean, that's true, but <laughs> it's really on this. Okay? <laughs> so, Jane Eyre, let me, let me set it up for you. Um, okay. Go into it. So, after they kissed... The Darkling started to give me some really Edward Fairfax Rochester vibes. Wait, which which time? The first, the first time, time or the ballroom time? The first time. The first time. <laughs> um, because not the weird makeout sesh. Okay. Immediately after kissing her, out of nowhere, he up and mm-hmm. leaves the palace. And honestly, yeah. that is such a Rochester move because in Jane Eyre, <laughs> Rochester and Jane have been growing closer and occasionally having chats. And even the rest of the staff say that he's been making a pet of her. Mm. And sometimes he just ignores her for weeks. But then when they do talk, their interactions are like weirdly intimate, given the fact that, you know, she's she's his inferior and hashtag kiss my palms. They have like a social shut up. <laughs> the thing is, wait for it. <laughs> <laughs> um so in Jane Eyre one night after she saves his life they have a pivotal kind of like shift in their relationship and I think it's he kisses her hand or something and she's like he kisses her palms shush, shush. <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> and she's like holy crap did that actually happen and then she's thinking like the next day like oh my god how am I going to interact in front of him because like did I dream that And instead, she hears that Rochester's left early that morning, and he doesn't usually return from his travels for, like, months at a time. So she's like, oh my god, he just is gone. And that's exactly what the Darkling does. (laughs) All those things. He just, he just disappears. He's like, bye. Well, he's also like, he's also like, made like a pet of her, you know, and like, will call her into his office to be like, so how's it going? And she's like, why the hell are you having this conversation? I'm yeah. just me, and you're like, you know... I'm trying to live my life. The most powerful being in in all of Ravka right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that's kind of like a lot of the dynamics between Jane and Rochester, where, like, at first, she's like, why does he want to have a conversation with me? He's a freaking, like, lord. He's not. Yeah. He's a gentleman. A landed gentry member person. Anyways. Okay. So member person. Then when the winter ball rolls around, um, in Shadow and Bone, and she gets a mm-hmm. black kefta with his symbol, it feels like a weird way of claiming her. Like that for me, I was like, yeah. this is mm. thing is, Rochester pulls I was, the same. I was just move. like all I could think of was just I'm like, okay, this is the time, be my bride. <laughs> You keep saying it, that, but I for would, me, I, it was I, never going to be like that. I was like, look, wear this black cuffed up, be my bride. So, Let us rule together. The thing <laughs> is, Rochester pulls the same move with Jane after they get engaged, where he buys her all this gaudy shit that she doesn't even want. And she's like, I would never wear this. This is so not me. <laughs> and I think he even gets her like a really heavy necklace that's like got too much jewels on it and she's like uh it's choking me it's chains or whatever that's the suggestion um and then on her wedding day jane has a famous line where she stands in front of the mirror and feels like she's seeing someone else in the mirror like who she's looking at doesn't look like her because it's dressed Mm -hmm. in all this weird stuff that's so not like her to wear yeah and you know what alina said when she saw herself done up in the black kefta for the party i literally have that the quote look like her when i was ready i examined myself in the little little mirror above the basin i felt exotic and mysterious like i was wearing some other far more glamorous girls clothes so another similar topic is the idea of getting involved with a powerful man right? Mm -hmm. In Jane Eyre, she meets a bunch of women who are basically examples of what could happen to her if she continues to foster a relationship with her superior, with Rochester. Mm -hmm. And Alina has that as well in Genya and Zoya, because Genya's involvement, like you were saying that that was the foreshadowing moment when Genya says, like, a little warning. But for me, Genya Mm -hmm. as a character is that warning. Genya's involvement yeah. with the king has affected her reputation, and she is pretty much an outcast among both, like, the servants and the Grisha. 
Yeah. Also, existing in, like, a liminal space of unbelonging is another really big theme in Jane Eyre, because as governess, Jane Eyre is not part of the household or the family, but she's also mm. not part of the servants. And so yeah. that's, yeah, that's a huge part of Jane Eyre. Zoya is sort of like Blanche Ingram to me, and Blanche Ingram is a character in Jane Eyre, and she's like this really snooty lady who... um hopes to marry Rochester, but Rochester's really oh. only, like, courting her in front of Jane so that Jane will get jealous. <sighs> but Blanche is kind of, like, a favorite, or, like, seems like a kind of favorite of Rochester's. Sure. And so, like, Zoya is beautiful, and everything Agrisha is supposed to be, just like Blanche is everything a young lady's supposed to be. And she appears to have been one of the Darkling's favored assets, because... Like, why would... I I got that feeling, didn't you? Sure. Like, that... Well, because well, of the way that she would even think that she could object in front of the Darkling to, like, the one in the scene where they meet the Darkling. Yeah. And I was also just tent. thinking because, like, she's so jealous of Alina. Yeah. Like, that kind of makes me think that she once thought that she could be the favorite, you know? Yeah. And that Alina has usurped her. Mm -hmm. Um, but now, yeah, and now that Alina is here, she's shunted to the side. Yeah. Also, I feel like this one might be a bit of a stretch, but I feel like Bagra kind of feels like a Bertha Mason character. Not because, like, she's, you know, the Darkling's secret wife or something, but just that, like, Bagra holds that secret of the Darkling. And, um... When she explains the evil plans of the Darklings to um, Alina, it's kind of like when Jane finds out about the Madwoman in the attic. But also yeah. in that scene, Alina repeatedly questions Bagra's sanity, and Bertha Mason is supposed to be insane. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so that's that thing. And then also, I don't know why I didn't look this up before, but guess what Alina's name means? San. It means noble no. in a lot of um, cultures, but it means light. Ah. It's like, duh. How did I not? Of course it does. <laughs> of course it does. Of course it Plus, my friend pointed out the dynamics between the Darkling and Alina are very Angel in the House-esque, which is a big thing in Jane Eyre, um, mm. which is kind of like this idea that, that like the wife is really angelic obviously but just that she's perfect Mm. and she makes everything better and one of the things that rochester does is constantly talk to jane like having jane in his life or just that jane being so pure and innocent is going to redeem him that she's going to save him from all the bad things that he's done in his past yeah so the fact that alina is worshipped like a saint and the connotations of her power, which is light, they're very angelic. Yeah. And the Darkling repeatedly alludes to Alina as being his, like, saving grace, that she will fix all of his problems, or that yeah. she's gonna save Ravka, but also kind of, like, him, and redeem him for his past mistakes, or the burdens of his, quote-unquote, great-grandfather or whatever. Um, yeah. Rochester does that, too. Mm-hmm. Another thing, after Mal and Alina have been captured, and, like, she's got the the collar around her neck and everything, and Ivan brings her and is like, like, you know, the Darkling wants to see you. And she's brought in to see the Darkling, and the Darkling is just like, sit and speak. Yep. Yep. That is literally something that happens in Jane Eyre. Oh, I forgot about that. Where, yep. um... He does. He, he literally does that. He calls her in and is like, It would please me now to draw you out to learn more of you. Therefore, speak. And she's <laughs> like... Like, she says, Instead of speaking, I smiled, and not a very complacent or submissive smile either. And then he said, Speak. And then she's like, What about? And he says, Whatever you like. And then she just doesn't say anything because she's like, I don't want to talk about anything. (laughs) So literally like the same kind of conversation or dynamic happens where, um, and he also like, 
alludes to the fact that he's like treating her like he treats his dog because where he's just saying like speak and sit and that is literally what alina says oh yeah uh she says she's got the collar and everything i perched on the edge of the chair watching him warily speak he said i was starting to feel like a dog i have nothing to say i imagine you have a great deal to say and their their conversation continues but that is so like this conversation like it's so similar where i forgot about that rochester's like yeah just talk and she's like (laughs) about what it's like now he has this authority and it's funny because in a lot of the ways he did he did that same shit before he would just he he called her in just to see how it was going you know how you doing let's uh let's talk and she's like what you're 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 this powerful man and you're just like hey come chat with me (laughs) and in this scene it almost seems like that's exactly what he's doing again but there yeah there's something dynamics have changed oh absolutely that it definitely feels like a power play in a way that their old conversations did not but also the fact it would it would be kind of funny if he was literally just trying to you know go back to normal yeah but he doesn't really do that (laughs) no (laughs) at least from what i how i read it Another no. thing, though, is that they burn the kefta. Mal and her, they burn the black silk kefta. Yeah. And also in Jane Eyre, the veil that Jane was supposed to wear at her wedding to Rochester gets burned. Ah. And the veil was one of the biggest symbols of her garments not feeling like a representation of her and feeling like what Rochester was projecting onto her. Yeah. So that's that whole theory, and I'm totally running away with it. And, like, I don't know if... Obviously, it could be on purpose, or it could just be that she's... Lee Bardugo is kind of very familiar with this kind of story formula. And it's just kind of coming into the story anyways. But for me, I was like, I mean, she's literally running away from the palace and living like a beggar. That's exactly what Jane does. (laughs) So... It is. It really feels like Jane Eyre to me. Like, I was literally reading this, like... Did I just read what I think I just read? Is that not the exact thing yeah. that happens? Yeah. That's so I can understand now why you think that because I was not thinking it was even a remote possibility that something with the darkling could even be now. Yeah. Because I mean that was one way reason why is, I wasn't but... like willing to fully believe that he was completely yeah. evil, that there was some other thing going on, but then he was just <sighs> acting like psychopaths i mean oh yeah petulant child yeah and i mean the thing is that rochester behaves like a petulant child too but he doesn't have you know earth shattering power yeah no so and he learns his lessons kill people eventually he comes around but like he didn't do anything so heinous he's not going around like the darkling is being like uh yeah you're not worth it anymore bye dead I'm just gonna kill you. What? You're talking about his his feelings about I, Mal, right? What? I j- just, just in general. He wasn't gonna kill her. No, not her, but kill people. Yeah. Oh, okay, fine. He yeah. is so willy-nilly just willing to kill, you know, Any people old of person. Ravka, his own people, to, to make a, to prove a point, yeah. Which, which was so interesting because I did not think that that was possible i did not think that that was within his character or nature prior yeah to that at all honestly when we see him after i was like never worried for alina's life because i felt like you know he was not that kind of person yeah i definitely was like because he was a completely different character when we saw yeah. him after she ran away he just completely changes clearly he was pretending a lot yeah to know. it weirds me out because i I'm pretty sure he is the main love interest, but I'm also like, mm. no way, no way. And also Mal, like Mal. the thing is that their connection is like, so, I mean, integral. They grew up oh, with yeah. each other. Right. So like, and I kind of can see that like Mal could become, he doesn't, he's not a Grisha. He's no not able to be a part of that but and i can kind of see like him becoming to have like he could have political um discrepancies with 
yeah. with her, but I don't want, like, now, at this point, after they've given up so much to protect each other, I don't want them to suddenly realize that, you know, they're not in love with each mm. other. I know. Well, and I don't... I, I definitely do think that they are very much in love with each other, and it's not... It's less of that issue so much as the same issues that I think are the majority of friction in couples. It's just miscommunication. Mm. I, I don't think that, and and I don't know if it would be the kind of miscommunication either that would be detrimental to their relationship, that would cause it to crash and burn and be no more. I do just think, yes, my, my theory is that it will be a problem, mm. that that will be some friction that we will see coming between them. I fucking hate it when they do that in the second book, you know? I know, and I don't want it. I know, I don't, I don't want, want it either. At all, but it's gonna happen. kind of why <laughs> I so wish convinced. that this was, like, this was how the ending was, that, like, we understood that the Darkling sucked and Mal and her were just together. And mm. I don't want to go through that second book depression where all the shit is hitting the fan <sighs> And everything yeah. that could possibly go wrong is going wrong. And everyone is breaking up left and right, even though they worked so hard to get together in the first book. Yeah, <sighs> yeah. but I do, I, I do worry. And I feel that even at the very end, you know, watching him comfort her, that there is like, there is a lot that Mal has to do. There is a lot that Mal has to go through for that relationship to work mm -hmm. i feel like there's a lot well, less I mean, her for too, her to do and a lot more changed yeah because i mean when we see him he's like almost a completely different person because of of everything that he's gone through in the interim when they were apart sure and like i mean because the thing is like he seems like we didn't get a very good picture of him before yeah but i distinctly remember him being like you know a really happy cheerful person and like it, yeah. The whole time she was with him in the second half, he was he was not that. Clearly he had changed and it's like that's so depressing. Yeah. I guess when I mean it's going to be hard, I mean patience. I mean he's going to have to be a lot more patient, I feel with her than she is going to have to be patient with him. But maybe that's also just because we're reading this from her perspective. I have one more theory. Sure. I have something to say basically. Okay. So when we found out that the Volcro used to be human. Yeah. I started to think about that a little bit more. And so I had kind of imagined them like pterodactyls. Um, yeah, same. But after we found out that they used to be men, I noticed that Volcra, the word Volcra, looks a lot like the German word Volk, which basically means people or folk. Oh, right. Yeah. And in Russian, though, actually, the word Volk means wolf. So in Russian, Volkra is basically like derived from wolf, that they're like wolves. Oh. But depending on if this is like on purpose, you know, that she also knows German, it's yeah. kind of a play or a pun on the fact that Volk means wolf and people mm. and person, basically. Yeah. Yeah, the Volkra, man. Oh, that's so sad. And then another theory I had, because when Bagra was starting to talk about and explain all the intricacies of the stag and all that kind of thing all i yeah. could think of was this poem by sir thomas wyatt um called who so list to hunt which i don't know if you know that poem no it's like a 15th oh apparently my book says it's a 16th century poem and mm -hmm. it's basically when like petrarchan shit was all the rage and it's basically oh, about Sir Thomas Wyatt was in King Henry's court, and mm -hmm. apparently this poem is about Anne Boleyn, and that Thomas Wyatt was like, oh, Anne Boleyn, I'm crushing so hard on Anne Boleyn, but that the king was like, Anne Boleyn is mine, so you can't. And so everyone, everyone who was infatuated with Anne Boleyn, they were like, no, this is the king's, like it belongs to the king. So she was, like, owned by the king. Great. So Who So List a Hunt is basically a poem about, like, this person who's hunting a deer. But there's kind of no point in hunting this deer because it's so elusive and hard to catch. And so I don't hunt that deer. Mm -hmm. But even if you were to do that, this deer has 
like a diamond collar around its neck that says, Noli me tangere, for Caesars I am, and wild for to hold, though I seem tame. So Noli me tangere is Italian, Mm -hmm. and it basically means do not touch me. And it's something actually that's from like the Bible, because when Jesus was resurrected, Mary Magdalene saw him, so he appeared in front of her after he died, right? And she was like, she reached out to touch him because she was like, oh my god, it's you. And, or I mean, I don't know, she probably wouldn't have said, oh my god, what do you think she said? I have no idea what exclamations existed (laughs) at the time of Jesus' death. Anyways, um, she was... (laughs) freaking out and was like it's you and she reaches out to touch him but because he's dead he's basically like an apparition or he's like don't touch me don't like break that don't try to make me corporeal in your mind or anything Mm -hmm. basically so it's kind of like a quote that thomas wyatt is always using in this poem to make the deer seem sort of Mm jesus-like also this idea that like caesar the king, basically, or any king, Caesar has claimed this deer. And so, like, this deer is running around and it has a sign on it so hunters will know that this deer is protected by the king. But Mm -hmm. is it really free if it has that collar on it, you know? And, like, Mm -hmm. so there's all those kinds of questions in it. This is, like, Who's a List to Hunt is based on another poem that basically has the same kind of same kind of storyline going on but basically this guy is like walking around and then he sees a white deer and he's like whoa this deer is so beautiful whoa and this deer though has written around its neck that let no one touch me it has pleased my caesar to make me free so sir thomas wyatt is like piggybacking on petrarch's poem But it's basically Mm. the same poem that's retold, though. But they both kind of have this idea of a collar around a deer, and that the deer is something you can hunt, something you can kill, right? Mm -hmm. Sort of a stand-in for Jesus and or an angelic woman. Yeah. And for me, that's like, that's just really around in my head with this whole idea of Morozova's herd, or deer, whatever. Yeah. Um, because, like, the whole battle of ownership over the amplifier for those antlers seems, like, really represented there. And the fact that she then wears a collar, or even that she's walking around court wearing the colors and symbol of the Darkling, that feels like, you know, Anne Boleyn walking around English court. And everyone just knowing that she belongs to the king. So I don't really think that there's probably, like, anything to be got by reading it that way. And it's probably just Lee Bardugo being aware of those connotations and associations of of the deer and court life Mm -hmm. and ownership. Because it also just reminds me of Artemis in Greek mythology. Because she's, like, a symbol for virginity and then... She's also represented in the deer, and hunters are always after them deer. Like, yeah. And, like, to me, honestly, the whole concept of, like, hunters hunting deer, deer who symbolize women, and, like, killing the deer is basically, like, a symbol for sex. Like, conquest, you know? Conquest. So that kind of gives me all those skeevy feelings that I have for the Darkling, where... Because that's, yeah. that's all what's going on with him. She's like like a pet. She's like something that yeah. he can put his colors on and everyone will know not, not to mess with her. It's gross. Yeah. And I it's mean, ugly. because Rochester does that in Jane Eyre, I was willing to be like, he'll snap out of it once she, you know, demonstrates what a total badass she is. But that didn't happen. He just remained nope. a skeeve. Ugh. With her, so... Mr. Uh, Rasputin, the apparatus. Yeah, yeah. And um, then when he seemed to take over when the king got sick, I was like, "That is such a Rasputin move." <laughs> Anyways, yeah. So the apparatus. When when he was like, "I must speak with you," mm-hmm. and she was like, mm, "Bye." I was like, "She's gonna regret that." <laughs> yeah, I was, I was thinking like, she's this gonna... is probably something important happening. 
she's she's gonna regret not not hearing what he has to say and when i kept thinking of seraphina Mm -hmm. with with all of the her being her becoming like a saint and being idolized because seraphina spoiler alert the in the sequel you mean yeah all of the saints are actually half human half dragon oh snap because because they have the ability to project like their aura Mm -hmm. and for everyone to see so the people um believed that they were that they were saints that those were halos Mm -hmm. around them and you know they were different shaped halos that they they could do different things because with different strengths and the the mind games that oh i forget her name it starts with a j but anyway she she comes to the city and she is she she comes and pretends to be the newborn saint and gets everyone in the town to agree with her and collects all of the half dragons together and you know creates this coalition but is essentially sort of uh, created puppets of all of them and parades around as as these saints and so i keep thinking of alina's character is now uh, being prayed for across Ravka for her well-being as a saint. And I'm really curious, like, if that will ever come in handy. That people like her? I mean, the Darkling yeah. even said that. The Darkling was, like, a little bit bitter, like, toward the end of their conversation. He says yeah. something, like, about how everyone across Ravka loves her. And, like, yeah, how do you think it him. feels to literally be an embodiment of darkness or something like yeah. that? I'm just so confused because I do not understand how we can move past this. Like, how can we still... Because the thing is, I mean, probably... There are two more books. I know. The thing is, like, if there were two what more books gonna... and I didn't know it was coming, I'd be like, the Darkling is evil. But the thing is, I've also heard enough... And I know that oh, there no. are enough Darkling diehard fans that oh. something more has to go on. There has to be... Shit. I just... But I'm scared of it because, like, right now, I am Shit. in unforgiving mode. I'm like... Uh, absolutely. I can't with you, Darkling. I am as well. Here I it is. I, I found have... the quote. Okay. The people curse my name and pray for you, but you're the one who was ready to abandon them. I'm the one who will give them power over their enemies. Yeah. and so on he's saying like fairness what does fairness have to do with anything the people hate me yeah. and they pray for you it's like wow yeah. bitter much <laughs> <laughs> maybe you should stop being such a little bitch i mean i kind of get the feeling that it's partially gonna be a whole series of like he's so old that he's lost touch with like part of his sanity you know that like this makes a lot of sense yeah. to him. And of course it does. And the thing is, this is like, for me, this comes across as so Russian. <laughs> because <laughs> they were dancing with socialist ideas long before the revolution. And like a hundred years or or so, maybe, maybe more like 70 years before the revolution, the Tsar had decided to like release all the serfs and basically create more egalitarian systems Mm -hmm. and that actually fed all of the fervor that later led to the revolution among other things obviously but like even in Anna Karenina Levin is pretty much a socialist like he's talking about about all these concepts these political concepts of equality and how you know the world should work and that everyone should pitch in and all this stuff and like so the thing is that they they really were into this concept for a long time even before they had their revolution and established their new system of government and like it kind of even the darkling is kind of talking like that where he's saying like the king is a tyrant and Mm -hmm. i can make everything better i can create peace but that peace will be established through fear yeah and that's kind of what like you hear that the soviet union was kind of like where like people were kept in line because it was totalitarian and people were scared like people were disappearing and they just disappear and you wouldn't know what happened to them Ah! it kind of for me it feels like and maybe i'm 
imagining it. Maybe I'm projecting that. I'm not saying that this could only take place in Russia. And it's nothing yeah. against Russian culture. Hashtag politics. Hashtag current events. Hashtag Rasputin has Putin in it. <laughs> <laughs> the links are everywhere. <laughs> I mean, it's just a funny thing I noticed when I was researching. If if the president put Russian salad on his dressing, that would be a connection. <laughs> Do you have anything else you want to say? Um, I don't think so. I probably yeah, will for like God, in a couple days. Two chap- <laughs> yeah, for two chapters, I swear to God, I was like, "He's so cute and charming. This is so great." And then, no, no. Well, the thing and is, then, when we first then, no, meet him, anymore. you know how I was saying that, like, oh, that first scene, it's going to be so important. Got to see it through the eyes of the Darkling because it'll be important for him to see that you know she's somebody who would try to save her friend or something, right? Yeah. And I thought that would matter because the Darkling was actually a good guy. Yeah. But now I it's like, would... oh, that was all for nothing. He's not a good guy. No. Nope. Also, even with Ivan. He would have tried to get to know her whether, she, whether you know, yeah, it didn't she matter. did any of that shit or not. He was going to try and get on a good side. But like, even for to Ivan, in. just for me, I was thinking like, yeah, you lost all those people in your life and you're just going to sit there while she loses like the only family she ever had. It's not exactly helping. <sighs> Like, Asshat. if you start fighting a system because you lost someone, and then that system believes in a, <laughs> you know, for the greater good policy, yeah. that kind of, like, just inherently doesn't work in my brain, how that justifies it, you know? Because it don't. Because, like, if, if your family was a victim of collateral damage, why would you support collateral damage? Yeah. It's so stupid. Yeah. I still, I still don't feel... I'm starting to understand the characters a lot better now. I still don't super feel connected to any of them. Yeah. They're um, still not fully fleshed out. No. World building is really nice. Um, and now, particularly, like, at least with Mal's character, um, the changes that he's gone through and losing his friends and all of that, he he feels more real to me now. Yeah, same. And Alita's character is starting to get there, but I still feel like she does weird shit where i'm like no one who are you no one does that. yeah <laughs> no one no one smiles good guys don't look at explosions <laughs> why did you think like, of no that because no one smiles when they're walking away from destruction okay all right i mean yeah she just doesn't feel real like in conversation to me no no she really doesn't i'm excited for book two siege and storm yes I've no, I, I feel like I have no idea what's going to happen. I'm nervous, um, like you said. I guess they'll be on a boat. Sounds like they're going to, like, Germany or something. Oh, really? Or actually, if they were on anything. a boat, and if it were really Russia, they would be in the Baltic Sea, and they could either be going to, like, Norway or Sweden or France, mm. as well as Germany. It's going to get it's gonna get interesting. We're going we're gonna to see what the real, the real fight's going to be about. This is going to be the thing that I didn't want it to be, which was, like, a global showdown and, like, yeah. a redistribution of power. Yep. I did not want that. <laughs> yep. And here we are. All right. Let's wrap it up. I don't know how to end these things. All right. Well, we can just say... Those have been our f- feelings and theories. We can just say... It was say, a terrible wrap up. Oh, my God. <laughs> you have to edit all this out, and we're just going to end with, like, a simple... I'm pretty sure that's all we like, have to cool, say. Bye. So we're going to finish up. And say goodbye. Great. Look at that. So much better. I'll just keep that part. That's good. Okay, great. I am Kalinda. I am Ivy. And we'll see you next time. Bye. That's it for now. If you liked today's show, please give it a rating on iTunes or subscribe on YouTube. We'd really appreciate it. You can find us on Twitter and Tumblr at Tangents and Tomes. And if you have any questions, email us at tangentsandtomes at gmail.com.